cause of life. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of beginnings. The Hebrew book Barashith. Simply means in the beginning. The book of Genesis, chapter 1. I'm going to look today, well, the 15th and, and 22nd of this year, churches across the country picking one of those Sundays to emphasize the sanctity of life. We're doing that today. Uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen, but I really want you to have your own Bible. So if you'll see me after the service, we'll make arrangements for you to get a copy of the Scriptures. Stand with me, if you would, as we, as we read this portion of Scripture. Follow along as I read from the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. As we're thinking today about abortion, personhood, and the image of God. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we embrace this passage anew and afresh today. May we recognize that it is, in a secular culture, one of the most dangerous passages in all of Scripture. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in Jesus' name and so grateful uh, for those who stand in the gap. Grateful for those who are on the front lines of life. Uh, promoting uh, what you, the Creator, would have us promote. That life is sacred because every baby in the womb is a human being um, put there by you Help us today to think through this again, to be increasingly pro-life because we are followers of Jesus Christ, and then help us to, to show gospel love and gospel light in a culture that has lost its way on this matter. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. As Kathy mentioned, next Sunday, the 22nd of January, is the 44th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision we know as Roe v. Wade. It was the case filed by Norma McCorvey, uh, known in the court documents as Jane Roe, against Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas County, who was in that position from 1951 to 1987, who was enforcing a Texas law that prohibited abortion except to save a woman's life. We now know, looking back, Norman McCorvey has admitted this, that it was, it was all a fraud, it was false. The whole, the whole system of Roe v. Wade was built upon a lie. But that should not surprise us, because we have as the enemy of our souls uh, the, the father of lies, the devil himself, who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And it was one of his tools to set in motion uh, the, the American Holocaust. Scores of millions of unborn babies slaughtered in the womb in the name of choice. The case was actually argued December 13, 1971 and was not decided until some a couple of years later, a year and a half later. I want us to think today about this matter, this matter of abortion. What's the video you saw? I hope you picked up on uh, the focus tool in the midst of it, and that's uh, the ultrasound equipment. As Kathy said, uh, statistics show that 95% of young women who see an ultrasound uh, of their baby choose life. You need to also know that in the abortion industry, that one of the things they hate is an ultrasound. 
In some places they are required, some states they're required to, to use one, but they, they always position the young woman in a way that she cannot see the ultrasound. You see, we've made incredible strides uh, in terms of medical science uh, since Roe v. Wade was uh, forced upon us uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States. We know a lot more now, scientifically, than we knew uh, previously. Uh, we know that, uh, that a beating heart is picked up early on. We know that brain activity is picked up early on. In fact, these things happen many times before a young woman even knows for sure that she is with child. And so what I want us to think about today in these few minutes we have is this passage in Genesis. I've got a friend of mine who recently published a, a, a brief work about why Genesis, 26 reasons Genesis 1-1 one, one is, is the most dangerous verse in the Bible. And by dangerous, he means that if you embrace that, then all of the, all the secular cultural arguments fall by the wayside. There's a reason, brothers and sisters, that, uh, that Darwinism, uh, that Planned Parenthood, that they, that they push an agenda that says there is no God and we are not made in the image of God because if you can destroy Genesis 1 through 11, then you can throw open Pandora's box for all manner of evil. And it is, it is a critical passage, and we're just taking a portion of it this morning to think along two lines, the image of God and the personhood of the unborn. Look at the text with me. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. God says, notice the language here. Focus in on this. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Look at the language there. The image of God. One writer has said that, that the image of God in human personhood uh, it's a twofold argument that has got to be advanced, embraced, understood uh, by the church if we are to win the day in a culture of death, if we're going to replace it with a culture of life. This image of God, this Im imago Dei, it's called, uh, is very significant. The scripture in Genesis 1 challenges the notion that we, that we came here through a process of evolution. Uh, there was no indiscriminate, uh, non-identifiable blob that over a course of eons became something like a person. This text before us this morning and others in the scripture that support it tell us plainly that God, the God who created everything, created male and female, created human beings, the image of God. Exodus 20, 13, part of the Ten Commandments, and it's, it's cited again in Deuteronomy 5, 17, says you shall not murder, you shall not take the life of another person. The reason for that is because the scripture recognizes that every human being uh, from the moment of conception uh, is a cr it's a creature made in the image of God. Uh, that we don't become at some point along the way uh, viable human beings, but we are from the moment of conception. This narrative makes it clear that the same God who created the heavens and the earth crafted humanity. You remember in the, in the Genesis narrative that God created, he said it's good. And there was evening and there was morning and there was, the days began to count. He created and it was good. He created and it was good. And in the passage before us this morning, when he made mankind in his image, he said, it is very good. We know as we read through the narrative and the retelling of the Genesis account 
that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the man from the earth that he formed, and he became a living soul. You see, this image of God sets us apart from the animal kingdom. He made all the animals. When he created Adam, he had Adam name all the animals. The image of God means that we bear an eternality about us. Everything else God created goes away. It either wastes through decay or time. Even the beating heart of animals stops at some point. But we alone, we alone in all of creation, human beings in all of creation, when our beating heart stops, we enter into eternity because we have a soul. If you, if you listen to the children who are catechized, what did God give Adam and Eve besides a body? The answer is he gave them a soul that will never die. When you ask them, how do you know that you have a soul? The Bible tells me so. It is that which sets us apart from the animal kingdom, the capacity to, to relate to our creator rationally, to have personality, uh, to have, as the scripture says, he has set eternity in our hearts. Every, every human being, the, the hardest heart you know, the most angry person you know who, who seems to hate God and hate the things of God and hate the word of God, has eternity in his or her heart. And we need to remember that, by the way, when we are discussing this and debating this and asserting this, that even when we're speaking to people who, who hate us because we stand for life, and in their minds we stand against a woman's choice, we need to remember that they too are creatures made in the image of God. We must approach it with a, with a gospel tone, with, with gospel light and gospel love, and not betray uh, the position we stand we're told that murder is wrong because it is the taking of the life of someone made in God's image. It is the slaughter of an image bearer. The scripture tells us that we were created for a purpose, to glorify God. Again, in the catechism, we ask our children, who made you? God made me. What else did God make? God made all things. Well, why did God make you in all things? for his own glory, or as we ask them in the more advanced catechism, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's uniquely human, that we can praise God. Yes, the heavens declare the glory of God, as we, as we sang an allusion to that earlier today, but only human beings can take up the name and praise their creator uniquely. We are made in the image of God. We're his image bearers. So in Isaiah 43, 7, which we read responsibly, God says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You see, as we have purpose, it's only man, Adam and Eve, our first parents, whom God instructed to take dominion in the garden. Everything else in the garden, everything animate and inanimate, was to serve the creator by being sub subdued by man. He alone was placed in dominion. When God blessed him, he blessed him uniquely. He would be the one who would care for the garden. He would be the one who would show the way of God. He and his helpmate, and no other, nothing else in creation would do that. It was the unique task of man. Genesis 2, 15 to 17 says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of, the good, of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, we don't read anywhere that God commands in that sense of accountability to any of his creatures. And it's only man, and man is accountable because he is a creature made in the image of God. And we could read just passage after passage, but I want it, I want it to, to 
grip you today that we are for life. We are for life in the womb. And we're going to show you why the scripture teaches how it teaches that life begins at conception. We are for life in the womb. We are for life at its beginning. And we are for life at its end. And it's not surprising, it should not be surprising to us, that a culture that denies that God is the author of life will have no problem along the way choosing who gets to live and who doesn't get to live at both ends of the spectrum. You see, being pro-life uh, and against uh, the abortion of unborn children in the womb also means that we are for the elderly, for the infirm, for the severely handicapped. Why is that? It's not because we're more emotional than others. It's because our Bible tells us that everyone at every stage of life is made in the image of God. Second thing I want you to think about is the personhood of the unborn. Look at our text again. Notice the language of personhood that's used. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. He goes on down in verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them. And as I said earlier, gave them dominion over. The language of scripture is that way because it's, we're talking about personality. We're talking about personhood. It's unique to human beings. You see, there's a question these ultimate questions that are asked. Where does life come from, the life of a human being? When does it begin? Those questions have to be answered because they will affect the way life is treated. I referenced earlier, we have some incredible scientific data available now that was not when Roe v. Wade was made the law of the land. This word, if you've heard it in the, in the abortion debate of viability, if you listen carefully to those who advocate abortion, they'll say, well, at this particular point in gestation, the fetus is not viable. We know that a heart begins beating at three weeks. I would challenge you to think back and ask yourself, if you, if you yourself have been pregnant, did you know at three weeks that you were pregnant, for sure. You see, by the time most women discover that they are with child, a heart is already beating. I've told you before about the experience that Karen and I had uh, when, uh, when she was carrying uh, Joanna. The OBGYN uh, picked up what she thought was some sort of an anomaly uh, in the tests being run. And I was sitting out in the car reading uh, you can chastise me for that if you, you might say, so you should have been in there with her. But I was sitting on the car reading, and Karen came out and was clearly gripped, tearful. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, you need to come inside. And so we went inside to meet with the doctor. And I said, what's going on? She said, well, given your wife's age, because, you know, Karen was something of a Sarah when she was, when she was pregnant with Joanna and, uh, and then again with Jennifer, um, given your wife's age, we're just concerned. We, we want to do an amniocentesis so that in case we find any, uh, any situation not compatible with life, we could address it. Now, I just cut through the euphemisms. I said, you're talking about abortion. Well, we just want to be sensitive. I said, doctor, we believe the Lord has opened Karen's womb, that he is the one, he's the author of life. And if you could show me with 100% certainty that the child she is carrying would die the moment that he or she breathed earth's air, we would carry this child to term, to honor God, the author of life, who's able to do anything. Well, then she backed off, respected our position, but it was an interesting encounter because for the first time I was brought into the arena of the, of the cleverly disguised language and euphemisms that are used to promote abortion. Of course, 
the story goes on, God gave us a beautiful uh, baby girl, and she's here today and is about to give us a number 11 grandchild. Uh, clearly, somebody had it way wrong. You see, when we think about personhood, the heart, heart beats at three weeks, brain waves at eight weeks, ability to feel pain at nine weeks. We know these things. And everything we found out medically, everything we found out medically, supports what the scripture teaches. There's not been one medical discovery on this matter of, of life in the womb that's countered the scripture. It all supports it. You see, the psalmist said long before there was ultrasound in Psalm 139, verse 13 and following, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Listen to the Scripture's language of conception. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Our sovereign God, who sovereignly created all that there is, and sovereignly oversees all of life. Sovereignly opened the womb, and he's the one who allows a woman to conceive. Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking to him. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. We read during the... Uh, during the Christmas holidays, the, the birth narrative where Mary visited uh, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth reported that when, when she heard Mary's voice, that the child in her womb leapt with joy at the, at the voice of her Lord. Throughout the scripture, persons, persons, the little being formed in the womb, is a person. David, speaking about his sin, I want you to hear this now because this is so critical. He's not talking here uh, against abortion. He's not talking for life. He's simply stating a matter of fact. Hear this in Psalm 51, verse 5. As he's confessing his sin, this is the penitential psalm, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He is not talking about the circumstances surrounding how his mother came to conceive him. He is talking about his nature at conception. Brothers and sisters, sin is only meaningful when it is attached to personhood. Sin is not an abstract concept. Sin is very concrete. It is sin of a human being against the law of God. Animals don't sin against God. The mountains don't sin against God. It is only human beings made in the image of God who as a part of that image of God are given the capacity to obey God or disobey him. Listen to David. In sin did my mother conceive me. The scripture is replete. We could go through passage after passage where, where the Bible speaks about children in the womb as, as children. Genesis 20, 25, 21 and 22. The children struggle together within her. Ruth asks in chapter 1, verse 11, Have I yet sons in my womb that I may be your, your husband? See, Job 3, 3. And the night which said a boy or a man child is conceived. Eve said in Genesis 4, 1, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord when she knew that she was, was pregnant. In the birth narratives, Luke 1, 36, Elizabeth conceived a son. Mary, we're told, she found out she was pregnant in Matthew 1, 18, was with child. The biblical evidence is overwhelming. That when it comes to talking about a woman who is pregnant, no matter what the stage of pregnancy, the scripture dismisses the notion of viability because it asserts the reality of personhood. Personhood. Therefore, human beings 
even in conceptions, in conception in the earliest stages of development, are created in the image of God. The growing life inside a mother's womb is not an animalistic fetus devoid of humanness, but rather a son or a daughter, an infant or a child. Now when we say this and we read about this and we see the, the Holocaust going on around us, our temptation is to be angry. Angry people. We should, there's, a, there's a holy, righteous anger. But I, I appreciate what Tim Keller says on this subject of the image of God. When he says, we have got to be pro-life with gospel tones. He says the secular worldview is that, uh, that the reason a human being deserves rights, protections, is because they have the capacity, they have the capacity to reason, they have self-consciousness, they have the capacity to make moral choices, they know right from wrong, they have the capacity for what some, some professors call preferences, and because they have reason and the ability to make choices and they have preferences, they are moral agents and therefore are capable or worthy of protection. This is the secular argument. But listen to the Christian argument. The Christian comes along believes in the imago Dei, the image of God. And because they believed in the image of God from the beginning, they were champions, first of all, they were, not, not, they were totally against abortion from the beginning because if you believe in the image of God, you have to be. If human life is good, then life in the womb is good. They were also against infanticide, which the Romans practiced. They were not one-issue people. They cared for the poor. They cared for women. They, they didn't make widows uh, remarry like was the law early on. They were champions of women. They were champions of orphans. They were champions of the weak. They were champions of the poor. They were against abortion. And they put the rest of the culture to shame because of their belief in the sanctity of life. So that eventually, he says, the whole Western world adopted the idea of the image of God. When you believe in the image of God, the circle of pr protected life expands. If we're all made in the image of God, then you, you protect every human life. But if you don't believe in the image of God, if you only believe in capacities or some other trumped-up approach to why we believe in human rights, the circle will continually contract. It will get smaller and smaller, and fewer and fewer people will be protected. And that's exactly where we live today. He asserts that if we took the image of God seriously, first of all, regardless of what the law of the land says, we would know that abortion is a violation of the image of God. And we would be against abortion wherever we find it. We would be, if we're truly evangelical pro-lifers, we're against abortion. We take a no exceptions position on abortion. When I was in Louisiana and we worked with the Louisiana legislature to try to get a law passed that would be a no exceptions, what we call a clean bill. The argument before the court, when it didn't happen, the court said, "Which? so you want to protect all these children in the womb except those, the result of rape and incest, except when the life of the mother is jeopardized? And the court asked the question, what other citizens get left out by exceptions in a law to protect life? The only responsible position of Christians is pro-life, no exceptions. We should stop forever the murder of innocent children because of the crimes of those outside. A relative in the case of incest. A criminal in the case of rape. We would know abortion's wrong. Secondly, Keller says, the women who've had abortions, the men who've helped them have abortions, would not feel like scum when they're encountered by the church. If we believe in the image of God and say abortion is wrong, we wouldn't make women who have had abortions feel terrible. And I agree with that. Now I want to close. Statistics show that while these multiplied millions of babies have been put to death in their mother's womb, that we are seeing signs that we are winning. The numbers are beginning to drop nationally. We're seeing signs happen in state uh, legislatures and before state courts that are encouraging that will one day reach the Supreme Court. Most recently, January the 4th, the Alabama Supreme Court unanimously recognizes personhood
of unborn children. There was a case before them, Stennett versus Kennedy, where Kimberly Stennett uh, sued Dr. Dalla Kennedy, uh, her doctor, an OBGYN doctor, alleging malpractice because the unborn child within her died. The court went back and forth and looked at different uh, precedent, legal precedent, and came to this conclusion. They defined the word person to include pre-born children from the moment of conception without regard to viability. Alabama joins Illinois, Louisiana, Missouri, Oklahoma, South Dakota, and West Virginia allowing wrongful death actions toward pre-born children. And slowly but surely, brothers and sisters, the discussion of viability is going by the wayside. One attorney said, this case has clarified the law in Alabama by not extending criminal immunity to civil litigation where negligence has caused the death of what it heretofore been called a pre-viable fetus. The court emphatically held that malpractice law gave sufficient protection to health care providers, and that's gone by the wayside with the California decision. Justice Parker said that even if one somehow does not concede that the child in the womb is a living human being, one ought at least to give him the benefit of the doubt. Our law does not permit the execution or imprisonment under sentence of a criminal unless his guilt of the crime charged is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Listen to this. The innocent child in the womb is entitled to have us resolve in his favor any doubts we may feel as to his living humanity and his personhood. This is one of the most pro-life opinions written by any American court since Roe v. Wade came into effect. Brothers and sisters, we are pro-life because we're created in the image of God. We're pro-life because when God made us, he made us persons. We're pro-life because we follow Jesus Christ who said, I have come that they might have life. And we're pro-life because it goes part and parcel with the gospel message we claim that God so loves sinners that he sent his only begotten son that he would live perfectly keeping the law of God, that he would die in the place of sinners, bearing the wrath of God, satisfying his divine justice by suffering and dying in our place, rising from the, de the dead, living again. We must not be silent. We must not be mean. We must be vocal and active and loving and compassionate and show that the scripture breathed by God made alive in us by the spirit our eyes open to it by the, script, by the spirit that the scripture teaches that there is only one way for evangelical Christians to travel and that is to be unapologetically pro-life and against abortion someone said well aren't you pro-choice I'm absolutely pro-choice I want to bring light to bear so that a woman recognizes that the only legitimate choice, the only dignified choice, the only choice that will bring her sense and deliver her from insanity long term is to choose life. Let's pray. This week, there's always a big to do. Let's pray as this anniversary approaches. Let's pray as the incoming president and his administration will have the opportunity to select one to two to three to possibly four Supreme Court justices. And let's pray that God will bless this nation with gospel light as we re return to a time when we recognize that to take the life of an innocent child in the womb is to assault the very image of God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in Jesus' name. We're so grateful for your word. Uh, we're, grateful. we're grateful for our moms who chose life. I know for my own mom, it was, a, it was a problem pregnancy, and I know how she was discouraged to bring me to term. 
And I'm thankful she chose life. I'm thankful she loved Jesus and wanted to follow Jesus. And we pray today as the church that you'll help us to stand, help us to reach out in love. May, may we not be found as being mean-spirited and cruel and saying unkind things to women who have faced this uh, challenge and made wrong decisions. Let us show to them with word and deed that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe. That by your grace and for your glory, there is always a way forward. There's always a way back, always a way to come to embrace life as we embrace you, the life giver. So we pray for all the folks here Whatever their experience is with this, whatever their journey has been, for those they may know, help us to be light and life and love in this 